Hey. Uh, we have a couple minutes actually before we're supposed to start, but um, it was so quiet I thought I would take advantage of that and, and go ahead and get us started. Welcome to Olivet Community Church, both those of you here uh, present with us in the sanctuary and those of you who are watching with us online. We are blessed to have you with us. What is the essence of uh, worship? What is the core of worship? It is loving the Lord, amen? Amen. Um, John said, um, we love because he first loved us. I want to invite you this morning to revel in the love of your heavenly Father for you. I want you to revel in the love of your Savior for you that would take him to the cross on your behalf. I want you to revel today in, in the love of the Holy Spirit who sustains us moment by moment. And I don't know about you, but when, when I genuinely feel loved, my, my natural response is to love in return. So let's take a few moments as we begin today and receive the precious love of the Lord, but also love him in return. Would you do that with us? Been so good. 
so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness. fragrance of Jesus would permeate the place. And whenever we slow down long enough to hear your voice, the sweet, sweet sound of your voice would, would pierce the silence. Do it again, would you, Father? Meet us in these brief moments that we share together. God, we confess this is not the sum total of our worship. This is just this great privilege we have to worship together for a few moments. But God, I pray that it would be a down payment on a week, God, that is spent in exalting the name of Jesus. A week that is spent in reveling in the love of our Heavenly Father for us. A week that is spent in sacrificially loving and caring for those around us. I'll be glorified here this morning. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before you're seated, would you just turn around, make eye contact, greet those around you here in Jesus' name. Would you do that? How are you? Good to see you. Good morning, Dave Mills. Nice to meet you. I'll go ahead and be seated if you would. A uh, quick, couple of quick announcements. Again, welcome those of you who joined late online. We're delighted to have you with us. We just count it a privilege. Amen. We just have learned, right? Never take anything for granted. Uh, every moment that we can share together is a precious gift from God. And, and those of you here in person today, we're so blessed to be able to do that. I was talking with someone this last week, and there's just something about 
the presence of other people, right? Um, the Holy Spirit in each of us just stimulates the Holy Spirit in one another. And so it's such a privilege to be together today. Oh, my goodness. Well, hey, a couple of things. Would you take just a moment and bless us by recognizing your presence here? If you have a phone that you can uh, call up, uh, 812-457-9509. Uh, and text your name to that. It's so helpful as we seek to know who's worshiping with us both here and online. And, and then we just invite you, uh, wow, these are tumultuous days. And, and just when we thought we were breaking free, um, we realized that there's still a lot of people we love and care about that are struggling. Even while we're worshiping here this morning, there are people in hospital beds struggling for life, people that we know, people that we love people that we care about. And, um, and so I just, uh, I just invite you, if there's some way we can join you in the people that you care about in, in those very special prayer requests, please let us know. Uh, just text that with it. If there's some joyful things, my goodness, we need, we need the joyful things as well. Please share those. And then uh, unless you tell us otherwise, we'll include them in the bulletin. Um, and back of the bulletin is about 30 items that you can just join us in praying for. If you came in late today and there weren't any bulletins there, we'll be glad to share with you our copies of them. Uh, those of you online, if you are not receiving them already, uh, just let Kristen know. You can text that number right there and let Kristen know and she will send you. You will uh, send a, uh, a bulletin so that you can keep track of the things going on in the life of our congregation. Thank you. Thank you for blessing us by registering your presence here this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, go, this Thursday is our, um, our senior friends. We're so excited for the privilege of being able to do that. It is here. Is that right? It's here, in our, not here in the sanctuary, in the gym. And, and we just want to invite all of you, seniors or not, to come join us, but especially those of you uh, who the last two years have been such a challenge. Uh, let's be together while we can. We're, we're excited for the privilege of sharing a meal together and I invite you to come and be a part of that. 11.30, I believe, this Thursday in, in the gym. Most people tend to park back by the gym. You can come right in that gym door and join us for a meal. Uh, I'm starting to see a pattern here at all of that. I'm not sure what it means, but there seems, tends to be food uh, whenever we gather. And we're excited that on Wednesday nights, the food has returned after a summer break. And so... Um, uh, there'll be food this Wednesday night as we begin to spin up, but we especially want you to note September 1st. September 1st, we're launching our fall uh, uh, small groups. We invite you, there's groups for uh, women to come be with other women. There's a, a new group um, that will be, um, will be mixed, um, couples, singles, uh, adults. We invite you to come join. We'll be studying, we'll be viewing together uh, the, the video series Chosen, and then doing a Bible study on a passage each week from that video series. And if you've not seen that, it is, it is a drama based on the Bible. It is not word for word from the Bible. But um, most of us have discovered that it is um, very helpful in pointing us and making us go to God's word to, uh, to search out his truths for us. So beginning September 1st, uh, both the women's uh, group and, uh, and a mixed group will be studying the chosen. We have full spectrum ministries from, from nursery all the way to middle school. And, uh, and we just invite you to come be a part of Wednesdays at 6 at all of that beginning September 1st. Uh, our, our middle school ministry is already uh, going. Our senior high ministry is already going. They had a f phenomenal summer. But we're excited about the, um, the student ministries that are going on as well. We invite you and those that you know and love to be a part of that. Well, we're continuing our study today of um, the parables of Jesus. Um, uh, we've we've um, organized it around the idea about story, that um, Jesus told powerful stories to slip under our radar, to, to, to invite us to question to draw us into his story. And, and over the past few weeks, we had this great privilege of looking at some of the classic parables. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be um, looking at one of the most famous uh, parables. Um, we know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. It appears in multiple Gospels. 
Um, but we'll be looking at it from the perspective of Luke and Luke chapter 10. But in order to set the table for, um, for the parable, for the story part, this week we're going to look at context. And let me just say that the context of the parable of the Good Samaritan is absolutely critical for us. It, the context is this. What does it mean to love God with all that we are? What does it mean to love God with all that we are as we worship today? I invite you to let down your defenses, to open your heart to God's presence, to his word, and to step into that invitation. Let's worship him with all that we are. Can we do that? Good morning. Our first reading this morning comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The very word of our Lord. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Let the key. You are good, good, oh, 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 you are good. with me with you. God, thank you for this great, great privilege of encountering you today. Thank you that we can do that at any moment, at any time. You who created us and formed us, you never leave us or forsake us. But God, we're mindful of how often we forsake you. Oh God, forgive us our sins. They are many, God. Thank you that that you created us with the capacity to love. Forgive us for turning what you meant to be good and choosing instead evil. Thank you, Jesus, that you in love obeyed the wishes of your Heavenly Father, that you came and became one of us, that you lived a life that we could not live and you died the death that we deserve. 
Jesus, we receive that precious gift today. And, and just as you revealed to us, Lord, in your interaction with the woman who washed your feet, God, we recognize that oftentimes our struggle to love is because we struggle to receive your forgiveness. So we surrender to you today. Overcome our self-defenses, overcome our excuses, overcome all of our brokenness, Jesus, and allow us to just to receive your forgiveness today. And God, I thank you that you always give us exactly what we need, even when in our obstinance we refuse to see it. Jesus, thank you that you even gave us words to pray when words wouldn't come. So some of us out of joy today offer you these words. Some of us out of pain today offer you these words. Some of us even out of stubbornness, God, offer to you these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I mean, please be seated. Our New Testament passage today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. I invite you to turn there with me, if you would, in your Bibles. If you are with us online or are using your phones this morning, I invite you to go to Luke, chapter 10. It'll sound familiar from the scripture that we just read but it's important for us to see the context of the parable which is to come. So we're going to pick up the story uh, in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. While you're turning there, I would just note that in uh, Matthew and Mark, this story appears also. And many people stumble over, um, over the slight difference in context. And I just want to remind you of a truth that we learned long ago together. There was no mass media in Jesus' day, right? So uh, Jesus didn't just say things once and then trust that the newspapers would pick it up or that internet would pick it up. He had to say his teachings everywhere he went. So likely um, some version of his teaching that he's giving us today, he gave, I'm pulling this out of the air, but 25 to 30 times, right? And And... And oftentimes the context was slightly different. Twice the context was, was someone who wanted to test him to see if he was, the word that comes to my mind is kosher enough, that he would answer in the way that they expected. That's the situation here. When he told, the, when he gave this teaching in Luke chapter 10, the context was uh, a Pharisee. Uh, even beyond that, a lawyer, a, a specialist in the law, the Torah, um, stood up and put him to the test. We'll pick it up in verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Rabbi or teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to, to see that question really quickly. We've learned together today that if you you have learned over time that if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer, right? Um, he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that's wrong on so many levels, isn't it? First of all, how many of us can do something to change our inheritance, right? That's up to somebody else, right? But also, we also know that it's not about what we do. It's about what God has done, amen? Right? So, he, so he, he says, he asked Jesus this question thinking, and I'm, I'm reading into this a little bit, thinking that he's going to outsmart Jesus. He, he asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's expecting a certain answer. Note what Jesus does. Jesus says to him, the lawyer, 
What is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus was so good at getting to our hearts, and he turns the question back on to the lawyer. So the lawyer answers the answer everyone was expecting Jesus to say. The lawyer answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, and it's unclear here, but very possibly the lawyer had heard Jesus teach before. It's not clear that this was common knowledge in the early first century. But the lawyer also then quotes Jesus and says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus put together the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19, and summarized all of the law, all of the prophets, all of the Old Testament in those two statements side by side. So what would Jesus do when the lawyer answered this way? He said to him, you have answered correctly. Look at this. Do this and you will live. Do this and in the future you will have life, right? In other words, you're not doing this now. You're not loving the Lord. Now, lest we jump to any conclusions, um, I'm the lawyer, right? I'm the lawyer. I'm not loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm I'm the lawyer. I try and justify myself by my head knowledge when my heart is sometimes far from Jesus. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. The very word of God. Thanks be to God. If you're visiting with us online, um, we just try and honor God's word honor his truth by thanking him when he reveals it to us. Well, wow, we have uh, looked at this passage in many forms before, but let me just remind you, this is, this is uh, the Shema. This is, this is the prayer that every uh, God-fearer and godly uh, Jew would recite every day. This was, this was the prayer that was supposed to be in a little box on, on the legalist's forehead, right? It was wrapped around their wrists. This is the prayer that was in the mezuzah, the, um, the, the little, um, so oftentimes just a wooden box that was attached to the doorposts of their homes at a slight angle. Every time they came into their homes, oftentimes they would kiss their hand and then they would touch it. In other words, they're saying, I love your word, God. Well, you can't see it in this, and I'll leave this up here. I thought I would pass it around, and I remembered, nope, we're in a COVID thing. We shouldn't be passing things around. I will leave this up here if you'd like to see it. It's a very ornamental mezuzah. You can't see from where you are, but inside, inside this is a little tiny scroll. It's the same scroll, if you picked up a bulletin, that, that is on your, um, on your sheet there. My guess is um, that you're holding it upside down and that you're reading it left to right, um, but but um, if you have the, the little trailer, a couple of words on the bottom right, then you're holding it right side up. There you go. And and if you start from the right to left, let's read that out loud. Can we do that? Do you have that in front? They're joking because it's in Hebrew. Spence, they can't read it. Um, but it is literally the scriptures that we read earlier. The Shema here. Not, not just... Not just um, have the, have the notes fall on your, on your ear, but uh, listen and, and respond. Do something. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind or strength in, in Deuteronomy. Now, uh, let me just say, um, that's the focus of our time today. Again, if you get a chance, come up and see this ornamental mezuzah. Um, I'll leave it up there on the communion table uh, following the service. But, but what does it mean to love God with all that we are? One of the challenges of understanding that is that 
we are um, we're speaking in three different languages. The, the language that is on your scroll is the language of Hebrew, right? Actually, four. The language that they were speaking when the man probably said that was probably Aramaic, uh, a more common language that more people understood. It was translated for us into, into uh, Greek in the New Testament. And so when you look at this, when you look in Deuteronomy, you see you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your might. When you look in, um, oftentimes in the New Testament, you'll see all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. You'll see four items. How is that possible? Let me just um, summarize real quick and say um, Hebrew was one of the earliest languages that the world has ever known. In fact, my perspective is that it was the earliest. But scholars disagree and, and look at Egyptian or something else, but I think Semitic languages predate them. As we saw many months ago, um, it oftentimes started with word pictures, right? And concepts. And, and, and so they were trying to translate concepts by writing them down. It was a very challenging thing to do. What does it actually say when he says, love the Lord your God with all your, what, what you see, heart? That is the Hebrew word for heart. Levav, Right? Um, but understand this, the Hebrews had no concept of, of the, um, the brain. The heart was the center of their intellect. It was the center of their emotions. And as we've seen before, it most importantly was the center of their will. So when, when you read, love the Lord your God with all your heart, it, it, is, it is the choices that you make counseled by your intellect, and your emotions, right? Those things are all combined. That's the, that's the picture of the Hebrew word for heart. Oh, they understood. They knew the physical heart in the body. They knew that it was the source of all life, but it was so much more for them, just as it is for us. That, that translates to English even. Love the Lord of all your heart. We understand what we mean by that. But then he said also, love the Lord your God with all your soul, right? Nefesh, all your soul. And, and what happens here is that most of us jump to a Greek understanding of soul. Um, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, I want to say 23, talks about uh, us being body, a soul, and a spirit. And, and that is that is an advanced understanding. That is a Greek understanding that the Hebrews were not familiar with. When they said soul, it is, it is everything, every capability. It is every aspect of your physical, emotional, and spiritual being, right? So he's saying love the Lord your God with all your will, and counseled by your mind and your emotions, but then... But then love the Lord your God with all that you are. All that you are. The literal translation of, of, um, of nephesh or soul was literally throat. Everything that goes into you, everything that comes out of you. Love the Lord your God with all that you are. But then the really interesting thing to me, and I'm, I'm kind of a sick individual, so... If it's not interesting to you, forgive me, but, but the third word there um, is we translate um, might or strength is actually an adverb, the, um, the word very, the Hebrew word very. Um, so love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and, and all your very, <laughs> right? What does it mean? Mm. Your, your gumption, your, you know, very. Um, it's translated strength because, because that's the closest that they could come to this concept. But love them with all that you are and all that you have and do it to the nth degree, to the very, very degree, right? That's, that's kind of the picture of what we're talking about here. So when we, when we start to study the parable of the Good Samaritan, we have to be very careful because we can lose the, the, um, the invitation to love God in the midst of a justification about what we do, how we act. 
In other words, the point of the story is, is not just about helping other people, right? I was so struck yesterday. Um, my family was traveling, and I was by myself, and I was, I was just reflecting on this passage. And at one point, I was, my watch barked at me because I'd been sitting too long, and so I got up, and I went outside, and I self-righteously weeded the front, the front garden for about 20 minutes. And then, and then I thought, it's almost like I was talking to myself, self, you've done a great job weeding. You deserve two hours in the recliner as a result, right? I, I'm serious. That's what I did. I went back in, right? So I, I got my watch off my back by, by weeding for a little while, and then I felt so good about myself. But I went back in and sat down for two more hours, right? Um, sometimes we approach God that way, right? Um, he, he reveals to us his heart, his compassion for those who are suffering, and 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 then we say, well, God, I want to be like you. And we respond, and, and, and for a moment, we, we do something. And then we find out, I feel so good about myself for doing that. I'm going to give myself a month break now, right? I, I gave something to that person on the corner. I fed somebody at Potter's Wheel. I, I courageously stepped out and, and talked to my neighbor and asked them how I could pray for them. And I feel so good about myself, I'm going to go back and sit in my recliner for two hours, right? This is not just a story about helping other people. Any, any um, transformation that causes us to think more compassionately toward other people is going to come from something much deeper. Beloved, this is, this is a story about getting a new heart, about getting a new heart, a new mind, right? Having our mind transformed about... about um, plowing up our hardened emotions, our, our hearts that have become so hard toward the needs around us that we don't even see them anymore. This is about, well, how did Ezekiel put it? Um, having, having God take our heart of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. This is how Jeremiah talked about, about God writing truth on our hearts so that the natural response of our hearts is to live out God's word. So as we begin over these next two weeks to look at the story of the Good Samaritan, don't, don't bail out on me. Let's go deep. Let's go deep, right? What we're seeing here is something exposed in our hearts that if it's not changed, it will inhibit our ability to experience mercy. It'll inhibit our ability to show mercy in the world around us. But, but, if we can be transformed, when our hearts are transformed by the mercy of Christ, we will show radical mercy to the world that is unlike anything the world would ever see. So how do we, how do we gain this heart, this heart, of mercy. It's an oversimplification, but let me just highlight three things, maybe from the Shema, from this initial introduction to the parable of the Good Samaritan. We have to first see what the love, see the love that God requires, right? We have to see that, right? This is the starting point. Jesus didn't point to the law because the law could save that lawyer, right? I, I cannot say the word lawyer without thinking of my sister because I, I give her an immensely difficult time um, about being a lawyer, which is pretty foolish when you think about it because she could sue me at the drop of a hat. Um, do you remember my favorite lawyer story? I got to tell you this because I like to tell a story. Um, I say to Beverly, um, Beverly, what is brown and black? You remember, don't you? What is brown and black and looks good on a lawyer? And Beverly innocently says, um, I don't know, Dave, what? And I say, a Doberman, right? <laughs> and she says, I'm taking you out of my will, right? Um, no, I tease her no end. And, and God bless, we need lawyers. Um, but oftentimes, um, the lawyers are driven by um, someone that they're hired to protect, right? They try and ask questions 
to trip someone up. This lawyer was trying to trip up Jesus, and he pointed him right back to the law. What does the law say? The law had two major requirements here, and I'm oversimplifying, but I apologize for that, but two major requirements. First is the undivided love of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. A heart and mind totally, perfectly, completely absorbed in the love of God. An affection for God. That's what the law requires, right? And so we find ourselves, as, as I so often do, checking off boxes, right? Legalistically checking off boxes. Like somehow that could summarize uh, a, a heart for God. Uh, if we find ourselves like the lawyer... I'm just trying to meet the minimum requirements of law. We've missed it altogether. It is an undivided love for God. But as we saw, too, there's a second aspect of that, and that is an unselfish love for others. Now, those of you in Sunday school classes and small groups this week are going to explore this much deeper. Note that there are three loves, right? Love of God and a love of neighbor, but also a love of neighbor that came out of that a right understanding of a love of self. Love your neighbor as yourself. What, what we're required is not just an undivided love for God, but an unselfish love for others as well. And, and we'll see beginning next week that the whole point of Jesus' story, surprising story of the Good Samaritan. Now every hospital uh, every town has a hospital named Good Samaritan Hospital, right? Every, uh, we're so used to saying Good Samaritan, we don't even understand that that was an impossible concept for them. They could not conceive that there was ever a Good Samaritan, right? Every Samaritan that you encountered was bad in, in the first century to a Jew. And, and so Jesus is turning our world upside down. You see, we're not unlike this lawyer, <laughs> Not just in our need for self-justification, but each of us has seen someone in need. Each of us has heard about an urgent need, and, and each of us has come to that place where we sought some way out, where we, where we sought to find some way to escape the requirements of love for someone else. Well, what is the key to being able to love God with an undivided heart? What is the key to be able to unselfishly love others? We'll come back to this at the end of our worship service today, but let me just tell you right now, it's to embrace the love that God offers. Do you remember when that woman recklessly broke into Jesus' a dinner with, with a Pharisee and, and began to wash his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair, do you remember? Um, Simon said, Jesus, if you really knew who this woman was, you wouldn't let her touch you, right? And, and Jesus talked about how important it is to, um, to be forgiven. She loves much because she has been forgiven much. And the powerful implication was that if you have not received forgiveness, if you've not been forgiven, then it will be difficult. It will be difficult to love God with an undivided heart. It will be difficult to unselfishly love others. Do you know the love of God for you? As we look, uh, if you choose to join one of the chosen um, studies going on in the weeks to come, it will press you because they take a lot of license, um, artistic license. They they add characters and they add events that uh, are not in Scripture. And, and you're, you're going to be tempted to just throw that baby out with the bathwater. But what they do really well is show the love of God. And encounter by encounter, they show the love of Jesus for each person. I want to challenge you. Do you know this love? Because you're never going to be able 
to love God. You're never going to be able to love others unless you first receive the love of God yourself. Do you embrace that love? Well, if we, if we have to first see and receive that, uh, that truth about the love of God, the call to love others, if we have to embrace the love of God for ourselves, there comes a time, as we'll see next week, when we need to give the love that God desires to others. This is the beauty. This, this is, is where we see the love that God requires, we embrace it, and we offer it to someone else. We give the love that God desires. In, uh, and I know it's a cliche, but, but it's important visualization. There's two seas in Israel. One uh, is the Sea of Galilee up north. And even to this day, Israel, most of Israel receives its fresh water from that. Oh, you go in, those of you who visited there, remember, they tuck the power plant behind a thing so it couldn't be shelled from Bashan. They, they, um, they draw 90% of Israel's water from the Sea of Galilee, and it's fresh, and it's, and it's wonderful. There's another sea down there, right? right? Down below, it's called the Dead Sea, right? And nothing can live in that. Some of you have swum in the Dead Sea. Do you remember that? Trying to stand up and just even stand vertical, you can't do it because the salt content is so high, it flips you on your back. You're so buoyant in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Why? What's the difference between these two lakes, right? I apologize for the cliche, but it's such a, it's such a, um, a visual of this, right? One both receives and gives the Sea of Galilee receives fresh water from Mount Hermon and then, and then releases it down the Jordan Valley, down the Jordan River. The Dead Sea, one of the lowest points on earth, receives that water. There's no place for it to go, and it just stagnates. Um, a critical part of the love of God is receiving it, but also giving it, right? What do we learn about his love when we give it to someone else. We learn that his love is amazingly compelling. And we think we know what it means to love, right? And, 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 and we try and, and do a good job of this. I'm so bad. I'm so bad at this, right? The joke is that for most men that we, we say to our wives, you know, um, honey, I, I told you I loved you when we got married, and if it ever changes, I'll let you know, Right? Um, we're so bad at communicating love to other people. But, but when we experience God's love and give that love to someone else, God's love is compelling. His heart, his mercy, his grace in us changes us and transforms the way we see others. And so when other people look at us, they see Jesus. They see Jesus instead of us. And they're drawn to God rather than to us. I want to note that it's really important that, that we are not motivated to care for others. And, and over the course of the parables, we've been categorizing others as the, the last and the least and the lost. We're not motivated to care for the last, the least, and the lost by guilt, right? We're not motivated by guilt. Guilt doesn't accomplish anything. What we're motivated by his gospel is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the good news or gospel of Jesus Christ. What God is inviting us to do is to be a living representation of the love of God, to receive an, a new heart, the very heart of God, and then, then having been filled with the love of God to pour out that love for other people as well. Do you have that kind of love for others? Do you, have you experienced that kind of love for other people? I want to invite you, don't go a step further without, without experiencing that. Pray with me right now, would you, for just a moment? God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for 
the Shema, that invitation to experience and to, and to love you with the love uh, that surpasses understanding with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. God, I thank you that that, that love is transforming. I thank you that that love is, is compelling. And when people see that kind of love, it transforms them. And I think how many of us, even this moment, are guarding our hearts. We want to believe that we can experience. We want to believe that we can give that kind of love to someone else. But God, we, we're afraid that if we open the door to our heart, that we'll be disappointed or worse, that we'll disappoint someone else. Jesus, would you allow us to receive that love right this moment? To trust that the love of Jesus for us is sufficient. And God will give you the praise and the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Always love is, is compelling. I'm, I was right in the middle of my prayer. I was taken back to my childhood when I first encountered that kind of love. I've shared with you before. My immediate response was, I, I want that. I want to experience that. And I guess I want to flip that question for just a second and say when, when people see you, when they encounter you, does it make them say, I want that kind of love for myself? If not, I just invite you again, join me daily in saying, God, give me a new heart. Give me the heart of Jesus. Now, his love is, is compelling, but his love also is comprehensive. You oftentimes find a, a, a North American or a Westerner saying, how far do we have to go with this thing, right? What is the minimum that I need to do to fulfill the Shema, to fulfill the greatest commandment? How far do I have to go? We'll spend next week on that, uh, looking at how far the Good Samaritan went. But I just want to suggest to you as we set the table for that next week, the love of God, the mercy of God does not restrict in any way who is loved. And just as Jesus is going to take this lawyer far beyond what he ever could have thought or imagined that mercy and love would require, so he's going to take us that way too. Be forewarned. God's mercy does not restrict who is loved. But it's going to take us also to a mercy that not does not restrict how much one is loved. Next week, we're going to see the full extent of the Samaritan's love. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to experience the full extent of Jesus' love for us as well. So his love is compelling. His love is comprehensive. It encompasses every aspect of our lives, but it's also costly, right? Just as We'll see next week the Samaritan took risks in his loving. Um, the man that he encountered, so God took risks. God left heaven and came to earth to, to offer his own life for us, right? God's mercy takes risk. If you're trying to stay safe, you won't experience the depths and the magnitude of God's love for you, and you won't, you won't be a conduit for that love for someone else. Godly mercy takes risks, but it also involves great sacrifice. Great sacrifice, physically, emotionally, financially. It offers, it, it requires great sacrifice. If you're trying to protect yourself, you won't experience the love of God. But lastly, worship team, come on up if you would. Lastly, it, it involves great reward. Now, this is a, um, an interesting subject, but, but um, we, we do what we do because of the love of God in us. But God offers us a vision of what that love can produce. He offers us a vision of the joy, right, of eternally being in right relationship, not only with him, but with others who have trusted 
him as well. We don't do what we do because of reward, but make no mistake, God honors those who honor him. There is reward for those who will love. There is this amazing opportunity to experience the joy of the Lord that he intends for us. So I ask you today, how are you doing? How are you doing? Make no mistake, I understand if, if you've come to that place where, where um, you've concluded that I've got to guard my own heart, right? I've got to protect myself. I've got to protect my assets. I've got to protect my energies. I'm not going to open my mind to things that, that scare me. I'm not going to open my heart or my emotions to, to things that might overwhelm me. I just want to enlighten you. You don't have to protect yourself. You have a good God who loves you more than you ever could imagine, who's moved heaven and earth so that you can experience his presence, so that you can experience his love. Live into that. Live into that love. In just a few moments, we're going to we're going to speak a statement of faith. And it is a statement of faith. We're going to say these words together. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. I invite you. I invite you even now. Open your heart to the love of God. God, thank you. From the very beginning of time, you have loved us with an everlasting love. And God, even when like your chosen people, we rejected you time and time again, you continue to reveal yourself. You continue to extend yourself. You continue to invite us to come back to you. Thank you, God, for your amazing love that always invites us into your mercy. Meet us in this place even now, would you? I pray for those of us who never come to that place where we've said, I'm going to put my weight down on your love for me. I'm going to find my purpose not in what I can collect and protect, but, but in what I can offer those around me. I'm going to live into my identity as a child of God. God, thank you when everything else around us says we are not worthy of your love, when everything else around us says we've got to grasp all that we can, now, God, we can cast ourselves on your mercy. We can cast ourselves on your love. We can cast ourselves on your goodness. God, for those of us who have known you, who've committed ourselves to you, but who have fallen short and, and chosen God to, to turn away from you, maybe out of shame, maybe out of guilt, maybe, maybe out of brokenness and sin, God, call us back to yourself. Thank you that, that your mercy is steadfast and everlasting. For those of us who have known you, who have committed our lives to you, but have, have turned away, draw us back and welcome us home. God, we'll give you the praise. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just take a few moments and worship this God who welcomes us. Amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul Yeah. 
going to choose to put my trust in what God says about me rather than what I feel or what other people have told me, right? I'm going to, I'm going to choose to believe that my identity is found in Him, that I am blessed, that I am called, that I am healed, that I am whole, that I am saved in Jesus' name. It gets better. That I'm highly favored by God. Isn't that incredible? That I'm anointed with his Holy Spirit. That I'm filled with his power for his glory. Would you say that with us? Say it really loud and proud. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. Say that again. For the glory of Jesus' name. Let's sing it together. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. anointed, filled with your power, for the glory of Jesus' name. God, into this life, bring suffering. Lord, I will remember. What Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever, God, you're so good, God, you're so struck me as we were singing that 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 phrase might have been hard for you we might not feel blessed right now you might not feel called you might not yet experience God's healing you might not feel whole don't leave don't leave with asking without asking someone to pray for you because those things can be yours today God willing those things can be yours. We are in Luke chapter 10. It's a very familiar passage. I invite you to read ahead now to the parable of the Good Samaritan, but do it now from a perspective of a child of God, one who is intensely and comprehensively loved by God. Amen? Um, we're going to honor each other by allowing those of you in the back to exit first. We're going to encourage you to go all the way down into the gym, if you would. There's coffee and refreshments down there. And then we will look forward to seeing you next week as we continue our study together. You're dismissed. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name.